that's all right. People don't need to know what I thought of the conflict. <laughs> and, and they probably don't need to know so much what the students who were there thought. So uh, for those of you who didn't make it to the conference, I haven't gotten a link to the recording yet. Um, I will send that to you. Um, I would say just there, the first section before lunch, don't listen to the whole thing, you know, pick and choose, fast forward, um, just get a general idea of what's going on. You might want to listen to the first 10 minutes of each of the speakers or um, something like that. And then you just some reaction, right? A reaction to each speaker, an overall reflection. I did send my paper as an email, I can post it, but you don't have to read it. Again, that's a lot of time trying to get everybody on board where it's one and a half hours of prep, there's a three hour class and half an hour after. If you didn't make it at the beginning, you know, if you have to watch the YouTube, one and a half hour prep, one and a half to two hours, YouTube, half an hour. It might take you longer to write the reflection, right? So I want to make sure everybody catches up and keeps caught up and just keeps moving forward. Um, all right, so we only have seven people here, so we have time and I'll let each student react and then I'll go over the notes that I had. But by this point in the class, as I said in the, in the announcement, I think you can link this to a whole lot of other things that we've done, I hope so, but I'll do it if you don't. <laughs> so I just, you know, when we all were in the same room, it was so much more obvious that people were talking and I could go up to the groups and listen. And then I could stand up and say, oh, this is an idea these students in this group had. And all the other groups go, oh, let's talk about that. And I mean, it was just so much better. But, you know, we're all grown ups and we don't whine and feel sorry for ourselves. So. <laughs> Okay, so what have you got? What, what was your reaction to the reading? Okay. Uh, 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 Professor, if you don't mind, can I say something? Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry, but it is not related to the note. To the what? Uh, related to the taking note before the class. Oh, that's all right. Just say what you want to say. Uh, uh, professor, I just wanted to say that, you know, nowadays I'm just super busy. And one hand, I'm, I'm really sick. I can't even express how sick I am. On the other hand, we have our elder brother marriage ceremony. So I, I, I'm really sorry. I could not read and I could not take note, but I promise, um, <laughs> and I make sure that if I get time, I, I will I'll take note and I will do my post. Okay. I mean, I honestly, I believe you. I don't have any that, yeah, there's just, you know, this gap between my, you know, what I think a class has to be and what the students can actually achieve. And I, I understand that. So, uh, all, I can write this, that you've been sick and that you have, uh, what, internet problems and there's a wedding. <laughs> okay. That's, yes, ma'am, you can even feel me that nowadays I'm, I'm very busy. Yeah, it's, it's fine if you, but it's good to come to class and listen anyway, I think. You know, whatever works better for you, listening to the YouTube or coming to class, um all right so sauda are you there uh, yes oh. professor did you read it beforehand i mean i 
uh, scanned through it. Did you have any reactions? Nothing original. I just kind of tried to take in what they were trying to say. Okay, it's okay. We'll just keep going. Um, Ramesha, did you have something? Uh, yes, Professor. Actually, I tried to write uh, that article, but honestly, uh, for me, uh, it's uh, difficult to understand. So I uh, go to the youth, uh, internet and I found some information about the uh, deep ecology. So, but I have found that uh, deep ecology is an eco philosophy based on the idea that all life is of value in itself irrespective of its value to humans. Uh, this means that uh, Mother Earth does not exist for the benefit of humans and that humans do not and cannot own the planet. So I think uh, the environment is not only for the humans, it's also, uh, also for the everyone. We can't uh, exploit or destroy the environment because it's not on. And also uh, in the article, uh, Guha, uh, I think, yeah, the name is Guha. He identifies uh, four tenets of deep ecology and he offers a, a critic of each. And I would like to talk about the first uh, tenet. Uh, he mentioned that uh, environmental uh, movement needs to shift from uh, anthropocentric to biocentric perspective. Uh, so he mentioned that uh, preserving nature, the deep ecology state has an intrinsic worth quite apart from any benefit preservation may convey to future. Ramesha, yes, it's hard to understand you. Is Let's see, can you speak slower or can you change your microphone in some way? Can you hear me, Professor? Well, I can hear you, but there's this kind of noise. Whenever you talk, it's a little bit blurry. Um, I just don't know if there's anything you can do about that. But just, you know, Professor? Yes, that's much better. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, he mentioned that uh, preserving nature the deep ecologists say has an intrinsic worth quite apart from any benefits preservation may convey to future human generations. Uh, what I understood uh, from this point is that uh, preserving nature is the best uh, preservation which can be benefited to future human generations. Uh, I think I'm correct, Professor. Uh, if I'm not correct, you can tell me, Professor. Uh, this is what I understood from that statement. And uh, uh, because uh, human existence uh, depends on how much they think about the uh, security of the environment, uh, I think as humans, uh, we can't uh, live without the environment. So uh, because our uh, breath depends on the environment. Uh, yeah, and and uh, he uh, critiques about this point. Uh, he, uh, in the article, he has mentioned that uh, the two fundamental ecological problems facing the globe are the first one is overconsumption, and the second one is the uh, growing militarization. Uh, So uh, he uh, talked about that uh, since neither of these problems has a tangible connection to the anthropocentric biocentric distinction, uh, invoking the body of anthropocentrism is the best irrelevant and at worst a dangerous obfuscation. So the idea is that uh, I think there is no, according to him, there is no any connection between human activities and uh, environmental problems. Uh, but uh, however, I disagree with their perspectives. I think overconsumption and the growing militarization have 
uh, negative impacts uh, of the environment. Yeah, that's what I understood from the article. I didn't read all the uh, whole the uh, article. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, Shamima, did you come up with something? Okay, so everybody's going to have to try to type up something. If they if there's something wrong with their microphone, just so I know that you did just turn your video on <laughs> and then walk away. That's all. I mean, it's not like it's just you have to communicate to me. That's all um, that you're there. All right, um, sir. Yeah, Soda. So uh, can I add something? Like just now when Amis was talking, I just remembered. Like, well, it's nothing that important, but like I, well, why I remember like while I was reading, I was thinking that. I mean, these topics and like this perspective and discussion, like these, the at least at that paper that was like that article was quite old, like really decades old. And I'm like, aren't we, isn't it like too late for us? Like, why did it that happen? Like, so this discussion and uh, people already knew this like so many years before. This discussion was going on even back then. Like some people were trying to tell everybody, but like, it's, it's like, isn't, it, this is too late now that we are even trying to talk about it now. Yeah. So actually yeah, so Sauda, that's, it's something I think about, like, should I just teach environmental ethics to students from the, you know, at AUW and just start out with, okay, here's the problem, what are we going to do about it, rather than the history behind it, um, but, um, you know, I think, sometimes I think about that. The other side, well, you took a class in it, and so, I think the purpose of a class is to know the history and stuff so that, you know, you have a context for what's in front of your face. But I'm, I'm you know, I'm always sort of thinking about how, how to best teach this class to people in AUW. It's totally different than at Lyon, right? At Lyon, they still think it's a hoax. So like... Yeah, it's a it's a different set of students, but um, I yeah. will I will say from now on, like so far, you got this, you know, background, this intellectual history, the scientific revolution. Then you got the religion, and from now on, it's going to be the boots on the ground, right? And it's yeah. going to be what was happening 30 years ago, but is that still happening now? So from now on, what I'd like you to do is um, read one eight page article and then find out what's going on in your country. Is the same kind of stuff going on? Does that make sense, Soda? Yes, Professor. It's just like, uh, it was disappointing kind of like, at least my impression was that like we have this impression that like we like climate change and it's like impact it's just kind of a recent thing yeah and, and it's like we didn't even know like people weren't aware of this and well, like western media europeans or americans they were those like scientists they were the ones who were like uh aware and tried to tell everyone and every, all of that and so when i like saw the like when I was reading the article, I mean, it's a Asian uh, writer and she, in the, he or he, I'm not sure, but like the, this, uh, the writer, it, it's a quite like old article. So it's, it wasn't that like people here was completely unaware or anything. There, there were people who knew about this and were aware and were trying to create a discussion and trying to understand it. but. We only knew it like the public or the government tried to do something or even paid attention only recently. So it was like a very disappointing. Yeah, that's 
at the moment anyway, that's what I think a class is supposed to do is that the intellectuals are supposed to be leading, right? Like they, they, they're supposed to be leading the country in a better direction and, you know, spotting the stuff that might look good, but it is bad. And, you know, being the, the, well, Socrates, the one that exposes the corruption. And so um, at least when I teach it this semester, I might change. You can tell me in the evaluation if you think, why do we need to know the history? We just have to deal with the problems. But sometimes if you just think the problems, nobody knew about them before, you're not gonna, you know, you sort of need to know that, I think. Um, well, yes, Professor, I think we need to know this because if we don't know the history and the context, we won't know how to deal with the problem now. Like with the his knowing all of the history and context, we will know how to proceed, what to already, you know, put aside and what to like go forward with what things we need to ignore and what things we need to really pay attention to. Or if we don't study the history and the context beforehand from the past, then it's it's like a, like learning a lesson from the past so we know not to make the same mistake. Yeah, that that's the idea. <laughs> um so thanks, Auda. I'll you know that that's the idea. Um so Rossi did you have a reaction to the article? Yes, I do. It's in terms of the two fundamental ecological problems, um, overconsumption and the growth of militar militarization. So I feel that overconsumption has harmed a lot of like millions of children and they that caused them to go to bed hungry with a, an empty stomach each night. And a small group of elites live their life in luxury and that doesn't follow Mill's property, uh, liberty principle because Mill's liberty principle states that freedom is when freedom is when one pursues their own good without depriving or hindering others from achieving theirs. However, when people overconsume, they are depriving millions from access to basic necessities like food, water, shelter, and clothing. And militarization is no different. When a few developed countries have access to the latest technology, they threaten the weak to give in to them. And with each nuclear testing or atomic bomb testing, many living organisms were affected with their shelters being destroyed and food supplies um, lowered. So people need to think about ways to reduce overconsumption and limit the production of nuclear power so that they are not hindering others from getting their basic needs. Yeah, so you can bring it back to John Stuart Mill and um, the conflict between how people understand pleasure, pain, and happiness, right? The overconsumption. And then yeah. the two drives, pleasure and fear, so militarization is caused by fear, right? And I have to buy all these weapons to protect myself against these bad guys instead of negotiating. Um, so militarization is particularly important in Africa because the US makes billions of money. Our gun companies selling military, you know, guns to Africans who are in these civil wars. And that's a whole nother story. Um, but yeah, you can, I do want to give you the sense that you can apply mill utilitarianism. You can also apply like with Sauda, Mill saw himself as a visionary, right? The purpose of intellectuals is to be able to see ahead of ahead, right? And um, he had those higher pleasures, if you remember. And um, so a big problem is that people who are educated, the elite, they don't see higher pleasures, right? <laughs> They're just consuming and they don't settle problems through diplomacy and they make money on selling arms and feeding fear. So 
what are you going to do, John Stuart Mill? You know, your free society depended on mature people. Well, now what do we do? <laughs> Does that make sense, Rossi? Yes, Dr. Beck. I hope it makes sense to the rest of you. And um, okay, Shazneen, what have you got? Um, Professor, when I read this article, I thought there were good parts to deep, uh, deep ecology and then uh, bad parts. So I like that uh, the identification with the non-human part, like the world is meant for all living things to flourish. But then um, I think that uh, like some of the other speakers mentioned, overconsumption is a real problem because it doesn't, when, when they say, uh, you know, satisfy vital spiritual needs, it's not, I think people <laughs> misunderstand that. And I agree with Rasi that like Mill's idea of uh, pain, pleasure and happiness, you know, that gets in the way. And um, I was just wondering, how did we let it get this bad? Uh, with the environment we <laughs> humans have been on this earth for like 10,000 years but then from um, from I think the 1800s it got really bad after the industrial revolution and then it's been getting bad and then for centuries now nobody has thought okay we should like put an end to this people have thought of it but it's only a selected few and then it's not enough uh, it's not enough to get us you know back on track and I used to watch um, planet the planet Earth series uh, David Attenborough's and then I save a few of his quotes so um, this reminded me of a particular one instead of controlling the environment for the benefit of the population perhaps it's time to control the population to allow the survival of the environment um, and I like that I like that uh, quote and then there was also a meme where people um, say global warming isn't a real thing because it's still cold outside in winter and um, there was a meme where somebody put one of uh, David Attenborough's other quotes this man-made problem has reached the point where it needs a man-made solution and then people are making fun of him saying you know don't give him the means to kill all of humanity because he will do it just to save the environment because it has reached a point that it's uh, that bad um, and it's still bad nobody's going to step up and you know do something everyone wants to leave it for the next generation yeah i know and that's why again i don't i was like greta thunberg decades before right in high school it was depressing i could see it coming but i just decided you know i just have to live my life in the face of it and then try to do, use my talents. Like I'm not good at science. So I didn't, I couldn't be an environmental scientist. I, I just don't like that. Obviously that detail stuff, I'm not good at details, but the big picture stuff, right? And so how to create an environmental culture is my thing. But I just, I don't wanna get all of you too discouraged. I just you should decide what your sense of calling is in the light of this stuff, right? That um, you'll have to deal with it, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't be a, you know, a teacher or a fashion designer, whatever it is that you're meant to be, that you feel most comfortable with. It's just that you're, you're, as a citizen, you will have to also deal with climate change. It's just going to be part of your reality. Um, and again, even those early enlightenment, there were people early on in the enlightenment, the 1850s, who knew it was coming, but, but they thought by that time, everyone will be so in love with science and they'll know that science gave them this whole high quality of life that when the scientists tell them, okay, now you have to have fewer kids, now we have to have green technology, that everybody would do it, okay? <laughs> they were so naive, the old blank slate. And that, that's, not, that's a problem, right? Because pleasure and fear are, continue to drive us, those instinctual drives. 
Um, okay, so we'll talk about that more, Shazneen. Um, okay, Sristi, what you got? Yes, Professor. So others have also all, already talked about many things. Uh, I have pointed out something like there was a deep, deep ecology was like based on the um, self realization and identification something. So I think uh, they try to portray like how self realization is the essence of um, uh, making environment um, uh, like more uh, what should I say? Like we should, uh, for environmental changes in the earth. So I uh, like they try to put like self realization is one of the essence of the ecology. And I, I, I thought like it was also connected how Western people try to um, prioritize them, their, their self before every morals and other things, other things in the society. And I also found out there was a speaker in the uh, conference who actually talked about the individualism and the environment. So I think, yeah, these are connected. Yeah, Anne Rand. She, she really was not a nice person. <laughs> and the fossil fuel billionaires really have adopted her philosophy. And I, I don't think it's a corruption. I think that's what she's saying. She, and she is of an age that she should have known about climate change. It's the same with Bill Gates. His Kantian frame of reference, he didn't, at least he said in the intro to his book, he really didn't think about it until 2006. And like, I'm just this hick from the sticks. And I knew about it in 1976, right? 40 years before Bill Gates, right? Or 1960, 1968. And I, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing how wrapped up, smart people can be really stupid because <laughs> they can just get so fixated on their tiny little thing that they really can be oblivious and this class really is trying to make you right keep expanding your mind. I think your other classes probably are getting you, you know, focused on something. But mine is just like blowing your mind every day. <laughs> maybe, Professor, maybe it's just like maybe it's just capitalism that's blinding even the smartest. Well, that's people. what Karl Marx would say, right? So let's go over here and um, I'm just going to go through this list of the names, right? And I don't know how to make this bigger. Do you guys know how I can make these uh, letters bigger or do you need them to be bigger? Can you read them okay? Um, I can see them professor. just fine. Okay, so I'm the one with the problem, which is fine, okay? At, okay, so let's go over the outline. Um, well, let's start. What happens is I usually assign the deep ecology article, but you know, this is the fast food version of the class. And if anybody wants me to, to give them a scan of the article, I think they can find it online, right? Like, um, who, who did that, um, right? Anyway, one of the students did that. So I think you can find it. Um, the reason I don't even put it on the attachment is there are students who are really feeling overwhelmed and I don't want them to feel like it's one other thing they're not doing, right? So again, let me know if you can't find something online and there's some outline of an article you think you'd be interested in. Um, and then I, at least you know I'm making a good faith effort. On the one hand, I want the class to be a decent class. On the other hand, you know, I am cutting out stuff. I'm trying to be fair. Anyway, so the shallow ecology. So this is important. Um, 
the theme I want to get across is that everything we've read sounded like a good idea at the time. <laughs> And then it just went south, right? Maybe I'll start. I'll start with um, you just have to be wise, right? You have to be a critical thinker. Whoops, sorry. Um, so let's go back to Bacon, right? Bacon says knowledge is power. We're going to use this knowledge and we're going to get rid of all this disease. And we're gonna, you know, make so much progress, and people have housing and they'll have healthcare and have education, right? It sounded like a great idea at the time. And it it's gotten us a, quite a ways, but right, stop, you know, enough already, right? We took it too far and we can't stop, can't change our paradigm. Then you have lock property rights. Um, I have a student from Afghanistan and she wrote this rave review about luck because in Afghanistan, where she lives, the people with wealth inherited the wealth. And there's all these poor people that would love to get that land and work on the land and give it value, right? You could get rid of poverty. Well, the trouble is <laughs> there's no limit to the exploitation, right? So it was a good idea at the time. It created a middle class in the US. And now, eh. So the other thing about this is that in India, uh, India didn't tame the frontier, you know, the way the US did. The US, you cut down the trees, you, you, you plant, uh, crops you you know we eliminated the bluegrass all the even the even the natural grasses are gone right we completely restructured but in india they learned sustainable farming so in a lot of other places in the world they did much much more sustainable farming than the us did and so lock is the epitome <laughs> of exploiting natural resources to get rich. That's why America can't get over it, but we're exporting that. And it's just like, it might've been a good idea at the time. Let's stop, we have to stop. We have to change how we operate. And then there's Kant, um, his idea of uh, just pure reason, uh, Bill Gates still thinks, you know, that it's an engineering problem that we can re-engineer nature and we can save ourselves. And it's just, you know, you need to work with the people that are doing the indigenous farming, right? You guys have to work together. Like when you just get fixated on your little piece. So, um, so I think I'm trying to answer Sauda's question and Shazneen, like, how did we get to this point, right? And uh, it's a combination of it seemed like a good idea, but also the people for whom it seemed like a good idea were also profiting <laughs> and benefiting from this good idea. And that's, yeah, so utilitarianism, pleasure, pain, happiness, um, a free and open society, includes a free market, except it has to be mature people. And who gets to define who's mature? And now we've got all this stuff going on, right? And we have basically immature people. <laughs> now, Karl Marx, of course, would say, look, guys, it's all about money. Bacon, Locke, those guys, they liked their new idea because they gained from the new idea. Other people who were more money oriented or power oriented uh, co opted that idea or interpreted it in a way that made them rich and the West rich and all that. So, Karl Marx, of course. So, all of your countries are affected by this capitalism taking over the whole world and constantly creating new products constantly having to grow if you don't don't grow your fail yeah so that's still a huge part 
of the way our economic system works. And we can't replace it with socialism, right? With absolute power. Um, so we have to have regulated capitalism and that's what the United Nations is trying to do, right? Or all of those, um, the Paris Accord, but so far it's voluntary, right? They don't have any power to make a country stop, you know, go green. So still, we're still depending on capitalism to do it. We're still waiting until somebody develops the green products and can make billions and billions of bucks on them. And so Bill Gates is realized that the market wasn't going to do it. He's got to put his billions of bucks into all these engineering programs. And it's just a race, right? It's a race to see if the engineering programs and the indigenous um, farming and these things can, um, you know, happen fast enough. But, but it's so that somebody can make billions of bucks going green. Like it, nothing's going to happen unless somebody can make more money on green than they make now on fossil fuel. And that is just that, you know, the scale has not yet tipped. And, and it, it, I think Gates thought it would tip decades ago. Um, electric cars, you know, right now, it's heading there, but there's so much pushback. It's just awful. Anyway, so that's, that's where we're at there, right? Science, technology, all that was in the service of greed. And now we're just seeing if, if greed can lead to a green um, revolution. Okay, then we go back to the religious stuff. Because on the one hand, uh, religions in general have values that are, to me, consistent with um, go, uh, sustainability, right? Humility, knowing there are powers greater than you, needing to respect the creation or the natural world. Um, but then there's all these ways these religions have gotten co-opted corrupted, politicians use religion to do whatever they want. Um, and then the essay for today also gives specific examples of the way the deep ecologists sort of co-opt Hinduism and Buddhism and Taoism and sort of, you know, put them all together and that's other than the West. And it's just a, a huge oversimplification and it's driven by their own self-interest. So, so the first round of studying those religions was, sounds like a good idea, right? Yeah, this is good. And then what we read today is, oh, it got corrupted. So that's what critical thinking is about. And I, I realize it's annoying because everybody wants, ah, the answer, and then, oh, no. <laughs> but you're going to have to do that, right? You're going to have to examine and re-examine. So, you know, I just, I like Aristotle's virtues, but I know they've been used as this huge bludgeon for colonialism. Um, yeah, I have more practical wisdom than you all, and so, blam, I deserve to to control your countries. Um, and then the UN, um, that's more contemporary stuff, capabilities models. So, so um, you know, as you write your papers, as you start writing your, um, yeah, your papers and starting putting this together, you can anticipate corruptions, but you can also, you know, look at the UN. Are they actually doing things? Are they actually not corrupt, but they don't have any power either, right? <laughs> the reason they're not corrupt is they're powerless. So all they do is give you the best theory, which is a really nice theory. It's just that no politicians or billionaires are gonna follow the theory. Um, sometimes in my country, they don't even pretend to follow the theory. They just, uh, 
they just diss the UN, you know, they just condemn the UN. Um, in other countries, developing countries, they will be totally pro UN, but when it comes down to actually, do you accept these corporations moving in or don't you, right? Are you gonna give your people jobs or aren't you? So that's the way these things get corrupted. Um, so let's go over the deep ecology because again, sounded like a good idea at the time. <laughs> and then the next article tells you, the article I had you read says, uh, wait a sec, this isn't so good for developing countries like India. So anyway, shallow ecology is, the goal is really the health and affluence of people in developed nations. So, um, you know, fighting pollution and resource depletion is really motivated by the rich in order to maintain their quality of life. And deep ecology is um, much broader and it's about the biosphere. It's about stepping away, not making things human-centered, making them biocentered, right? Um, biosphere, egalitarianism. So, e excuse me, equal value. That was, this is similar to Peter Singer where he talks about speciesism um, and not favoring your own species. Um, so there's a respect for way, other ways and forms of life, and you identify with the world in general. Um, you develop a relationship to the natural world. Uh, every living creature has a right to live and blossom, right? Flourish. Not, it's not a master-slave relation. We went through that with Genesis. Um, and not letting mammals crowd, not just humans as mammals, but other animals. So in zoos, for example, a lot of those animals that are in cages, they, they are not functioning well, right? They get, they literally have mental illnesses. <laughs> well, obviously they can't move around. Um, so, um, so the principle of live and let live rather than you know, just remember Kant, it's okay to use animals for human purposes, right? So they're against Kant. Um, and they're also even, okay, so with um, Peter Singer, utilitarianism, um, animals deserve legal rights because of their capacity to suffer. Well, deep ecology is broader than that, right? So, so um, ecosystems, right? Uh, a whole ecological system, like a wetlands, deserves to be preserved, even though a wetlands per se doesn't suffer, right? But but you have these wetlands where when the birds are flying north, where I live in Minnesota, um, or in the in the U.S. in general, the birds migrate to the south and they come up. And if you don't have wetlands, that's where they land. And if there's no place for them to land, of course, this is gonna be a big problem. But a lot of that isn't based on suffering. It's not based on, it's just, you just preserve it because, you know, it's the biosphere, it's the ecosphere. You don't have any right to destroy it. These um, different environments that, together make up the whole biosphere. Okay, this view is anti-class, right? We shouldn't exploit, the rich and poor shouldn't exploit developed and developing. We should fight against pollution and resource depletion, avoid class conflict, uh, avoid jobs that make the problem worse. We should focus on, um, uh, they said it's, things are gonna get complex, but they don't have to be complicated, right? You can have a very well-functioning system that's complex, but not chaotic, right? And not adversarial. So the more complex things get, 
each of you is probably going to have to specialize more. Every generation has to specialize more to get a job. But when you specialize, it means you depend on even more people to do their jobs well, right? So, for example, you work in a corporation and the person in IT, <laughs> or you work in any organization, the people in IT better know what they're doing or the whole organization will collapse. But nobody else knows, you know, as much about that particular computer system. So, you know, it's just, we depend on each other even more, even more heavily. We depend on more people and those people each have more specialized work and more and more, they're the only one that knows or there's only two people. So these are highly sophisticated, responsible jobs that everybody has and each of you will probably have. And that can be complex without being chaotic. But if you have a system like that, that again is based on competition and adversity, where you're competing with the other guy in IT, right? To get a higher, you know, a, a salary raise or something. If you have people in these highly complex systems and they're competitive and adversarial, I, I think that's crazy, right? And so we have cybersecurity issues, right? You have people really smart, and now that's where the real wars are taking place. I mean, the biggest war right now is a cyber war between the US and Russia, but people don't think of that as a war because it's not like nobody's getting shot and you don't use guns, but the harm, right? They can people can interfere with our elect, you know, our electricity, you can do incredible damage to people. So, so complexity without complication, um, local autonomy. So this is also happening with technology on the one hand, everybody's their own boss on their phone right? and it's decentralized. But that's combined with all this incredible interdependence. So it's going in both directions. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So values, right? Values. Value systems are different from just data. So you have to figure out, you know, how to use the science. Um, ecological harmony, equilibria, uh, equilibrium, Sophia blah, blah, blah. And then there's another article that sort of reinforces it. We should identify with nature and all this sort of stuff. So this particular outline, and I think, did I give you, um, did I give you the freedom or whatever to be able to, um, to do your own um, sharing? I mean, Okay, multiple participants. So if you want to scroll through this a little bit, I'm gonna, it's time for a, a break, right? So I'm gonna give you a 10 minute break. You can jot down your notes if you want, right? To get this dang post done right away. And I'll, and I'll tell you, I think now that you can share, you can do all this on your own, but this is where we're going. We're starting out with, okay, sounds like a good idea. And then the article that I had you read, this was the, I had these, all three of these in Africa and all this, but it's the third one. It tells you, wait a sec, wait a second. It wasn't such a good idea. Here's the fine print. Here's what actually happened. And the punchline is that, those deep ecologists are a bunch, a bunch of Americans who maybe had good intentions, but they're ignorant, but maybe knew all along that this is once again to their advantage at the expense of the poor, right? So once again, <laughs> we have good intentions gone bad. And um, I don't know how many of you um, I'm old, right? 
Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever had good intentions that turned out to be to go south, <laughs> but I sure did. I mean, I'm divorced, so <laughs> that's a biggie. But um, so good, in, good intentions are not good enough. That's why critical thinking is so important. And I, that's also why I love liberal arts education because you get thrown all this stuff and you have to rethink and rethink and rethink and you might sort of start going crazy, but that's it. When you start going crazy and know you're gonna have to think the rest of your life, uh, then, then we've done our job. <laughs> okay, so I have seven minutes after, and I suppose about in, in about 10 minutes, eight minutes, We'll get back together, and if you want to take a break or if you want to furiously jot down notes and finish your post, it's up to you. Okay. I have to pause. Here we go. No, no, I don't want to pause the screen share. I'm gonna pause the pause it. So, all right, for the people listening, here's my goal. Please read the stuff before you go through the YouTube, right? So you're all prepared. You can do your, write down your reactions and, and we'll go for another hour, hour and 15 minutes. We'll be half an hour early. You know, you will have that half an hour because you don't have another class and just write your re final reflection and get that posted and move on. Because I know that my class isn't that big a deal. I know you have complicated lives, um, but I do, you know, want the quality of the education to um, be maintained, okay? Because AUW is a good school, but it has to stay good. Um, so here we go with the road to hell is paved with good intentions or with very cynical, wicked people who can, you know, engage in rhetoric that fools everybody else. Um, I do think that these deep ecology people honestly deceived themselves. I don't think they thought they were biased, um, but they were, or they didn't anticipate how this view, when it started getting applied boots on the ground, it would be really hard on poor people in developing countries. When you look at it though, and you think about it, it's like, how didn't they know that? I think that might be what Sauda was getting at. Was that what you were getting at, Sauda? How could they not realize? <laughs> is, that, is that what you're getting at, Sauda? I, yes, Professor, it's like, it, it it's it wasn't that they, nobody knew about it nobody was aware it's just people were aware but nobody gave it importance nobody you know paid attention right so i mean you know the auw students especially because you're women who are already outside of the norm from this places where you come from right so I think you should just say, okay, it's my fate <laughs> to be outside of the norm, to be the person that calls it out. Even though, you know, uh, John Stuart Mill said, it's better to be a um, Socrates dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. You know? <laughs> I mean, it might drive you nuts, but um, I think hopefully at the end of the day, you'll be happier that you know than that you just don't know, right? That you're 
blind or ignorant or living by habit. Anyway, so the argument here is that deep ecology is actually uniquely American. It's not universal. And that the social consequences of implementing it are really hard, are grave, right? What? The tenants are we have to move to biocentric. This was the good intention, right? We have to care about ecosystems, you know, not only just mammals and higher order animals that are more like us, but all the animals, all the plants, and the way they work together. Um, and these people, deep ecology had an obsession with wilderness, try to preserve the wilderness, whatever wilderness is left, right? And also restore degraded areas. So one of the, you know, things that they sent their people out to do was to maintain and increase the, the amount of land that's still wilderness, right? because then you're maintaining those ecosystems. Um, all right, so the preservationist one view is that other species have this intrinsic value and right to exist. Um, and the, okay, there's, there's two, two reasons for obsessing about wilderness. One is just because they have a right, we shouldn't destroy all the wilderness. And the other one is because we need the, um, the gene pool. It's a bad thing to kill off species, right? Because it will come back to us when we don't have a lot of species to draw on when we're looking for medicines or um, we, need, we need the bees to be healthy, to pollinate the flowers, otherwise we're gonna to have to do it in a high tech way, which is way more expensive. So, I mean, there's lots of plain old utilitarian, um, you could probably go online and say how much a tree does, what the things trees do and how much that would cost if you had to do it with technology. Uh, and it's amazing, right? Well, they put carbon, they absorb carbon and all this. But anyway, that's a strictly utilitarian, right? Maximizing human happiness. Um, but the preservationist is, it's just the principle of the thing. Um, and then the other um, point that the person from India makes is that it sort of mystifies and um, puts on a pedestal the Eastern spiritual tradition and um, claims to be cutting edge. So if you remember, they talk about Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, and um, the person from India says, that's just Westerners sort of idealizing, sentimentalizing us. Um, it's sort of like the way men can do this to women. They idealize them, they sentimental, they put them on a pedestal, and they say, oh, you're too pure and too wonderful to have to deal with that awful world of money and power, you know? I'll just keep you home and you can just, you know, have this wonderful life and exercise all these wonderful virtues. You don't have to get your hands dirty. <laughs> so it's just kind of like that. Like this, oh, they're, they're innocent, they're naive. They love the land. They're not like these horrible Westerners that have just exploited it. And so they, but it's just this person from India says, wait, that's just such an oversimplification. And it's, it's infantile, right? It's wanting to seeking lost innocence. There never was a pure innocent world. Um, okay, so this, anthropocentric, person-centered versus biocentric. Um, it's good as a check on human arrogance and ecological hubris, right? He's acknowledging that. And, and, er, and also that is true of Hinduism. We went through that, right? That the person who wrote about Hinduism said, 
we're going to have to bring in some kind of religion because religion has this these premises that there's there are powers greater than you and you definitely shouldn't destroy either god's creation or the good karma right or whatever you want to call it but this is this would be considered evil on any spiritual religious tradition but um the bad part of it is when it gets to that point that intervention should be guided primarily by the need to preserve biotic integrity rather than to preserve humans. So when it starts getting anti-human, then it goes bad because the people who really suffer are the poor. All right. There's two problems, the overconsumption and the militarization. Um, okay, so those problems are not caused, they're not connected to anthropocentric versus biocentric. And so um, the cost, excuse me, of ecological waste are the way our economies work, excuse me, the way politics works lifestyle choices. This is not deep, excuse me, deep ecology. Now, so that's the right, the writer says that's what we have to worry about. We've got to get people to stop consuming so much. Um, and even now, thir excuse me, 30 years later, we still can't convince Americans to consume less. And so we are in this race to see if cap capitalism can invent technology, green technology, where people can still have the big truck. It's just a carbon free truck. They can still have, excuse me, their, um, their drinks in bottles. It's just that the bottles now are much, are not plastic, they're recyclable. I mean, people, absolutely don't want to change your lifestyle. And um, that's, so that's a problem, right? It's the cause of waste is, excuse me, so many people's jobs depend on selling stuff that people don't need, that they shouldn't be buying. Politicians' campaigns are funded by corp corporations that sell people things that nobody needs. And so people make bad choices and they feed the capitalist economy. I mean, it's this horrible syndrome. And that doesn't have anything to do with deep ecology, right? That, you know, we could have more wilderness and less wilderness, but if everywhere there isn't a wilderness, there is this horrible economic, political lifestyle cycle. It, you know, it's not a big deal. That, that there's some wilderness being preserved. So what really matters is that India has a long settled and densely populated, has been densely populated. And so it has developed a culture where they balance with nature. Um, and so what, ha what actually happened in India is that areas are being set aside but what's happening is that poor people are getting pushed off the land or not allowed to use the land so that the elite can get strokes for putting in wilderness, right? Now, maybe they get money from the UN or I don't know where they got money. The World Wildlife, yeah, the World Wildlife Fund, I guess not the UN, right? The International something. But these other international organizations are coming in. They have a lot of money. It's American money. It's Western money to buy up areas, to recreate wilderness or preserve wilderness. The people involved in this project, Tiger, are ex-hunters or the, the Indian elite. And, um, and America has a national park system because the way we tamed the frontier was to cut down every tree. And so, yeah, we needed national parks to preserve our trees, but India 
didn't need that. And so by pushing people off the land, people who had had a pretty sustainable farming system, their poor, the poor people's needs are completely ignored. Um, so this international conservation elite is using the arguments of deep ecologists to advance their crusade and pushing poor people, making them poorer. So the elite are getting richer in quality of life, right? Parks and um, the poor are getting poorer. Um, then this Daniel J Jansen says only biologists know how to decide which tropical landscapes to use. So these Western biologists are coming there and saying, okay, you're gonna knock the people off of that land because we have to preserve that land and that um, e ecological system. Um, so it's a, another kind of imperialism, right? <laughs> another kind of domination, political, economic, and now ecological imperialism. Um, uh, let's see, the wilderness, okay, they're buying, okay. So the Westerners are buying wilderness um, with tactics, time, and cash, right? So Daniel Jans Jansen is saying, okay, this is going to take this long-term effort, but, you know, he's in it for the long haul. Then, so that's, that's the one point, is that Project Tiger is just one example. In Africa, there are a whole lot of huge uh, national parks. And there's also these places where rich people come. I, the guy who, I, I teach at Lyon College, right? Frank Lyon Jr., who his father is the one who gave us a whole pile of money. He travels to Africa and, kill, and kills these exotic animals, it's, you know, it's a big thing for rich folk in, I think, especially America, because hunting is such a big deal in my country. It's just awful. 40% of Americans have guns in their house. Oh, and most of them have way more than one. Um, but anyway, I don't. <laughs> so come and shoot me. I don't care. I'm not getting a gun. Um, but I went to Mr. Lyon's house for a party once, and the, the room with uh, vegetarian food in it, the room with the food I, I was going to eat had a rhinoceros head, uh, a whole gazelle, a whole stuffed gazelle, and um, this other exotic African animal. And it's just, oh my gosh, but that, that's huge. But that's all land that poor people get pushed off of so that the rich can have their little, you know, hunting. So that, and then, and that companies in developing countries can sell these packages, right, to rich folk. Come and for your two week, you know, killing exotic animals vacation. And we'll arrange for how you get the body stuffed and get it back home and all this stuff. Ah, but anyway, that that was one thing. And um, so there are those parks and then there are people like Jansen, who's, you know, figuring out the long haul. And, you know, the thing about this is it's not entirely wrong to want some wilderness, but the way it's done is so Western imperialist driven. And the elite in the developing countries either don't want to or can't really stop it, right? They don't, they can't say no because their country needs the jobs, you know, to develop economically. All right. So here's the other part of it the philosophy, they're invoking Eastern philosophies and they lump all of them together as having a biocentric point of view. Well, and we did that, right? I mean, I talked quite a bit about that. 
the distinction between the religions of the book where there's a God, personal God who the sons of Abraham and he has this very special plan um, as opposed to the karma the much more whole much more much closer to um, environmental issues the biosphere and the ecosphere okay so um primal people are paraded as concerned with the biosphere yeah okay so you don't know if you're putting these people down or sentimentalizing it's just it's just saying it's inauthentic it's not going to solve anything um okay so history is a conscious and dynamic manipulation of nature right so in india they develop their sustainable system of agriculture and they keep refining it because obviously they would like to eat with with the minimum amount of work it's just that they do have to have some uh respect they can't engage in unsustainable practices um all right yeah the people who were who wrote the doc the documents about staying in touch with nature actually were the privileged elite and they depended on people who cultivated the land in order to survive right which is true of me right i'm an ideas person i depend on farmers um i depend on the economic system working so that rich folk will donate to my liberal arts college like nobody is free from the system um traditional ecolog ecological knowledge is not mystical it's based on experience and the desire for self-preservation it's based on you know scientific reasoning right uh you just test things out experience and you observe the results and so you keep testing um so it's science it's just not officially western science um there's a popular scientific view of the east taken by western scholars which is pejorative right so there there are two sides of the same coin both the views the views that romanticize the east and the views that you know denigrate the east its religion as opposed to science it's primitive and we're advanced um they both they see it as other separate and alien um that easterners are spiritual and westerners are materialistic they're both monolithic simplistic and they deny reason and agency to the east they're condescending um <clears throat> So I do want each of you, when I'm done with this, I do want each of you to react to some aspect of it. Um, so he's, he's saying it's not really radical. Um, it's just a temporary antidote to modern civilization. It adds values to the lives of Westerners. So Westerners could go and have their wilderness experience. It's part of consumer society. This, is, this happens in the US, right? We have these national parks where we get in touch with nature. And I've been to some of the best ones out in the South, Southwest. Um, but you drive a thousand miles in your car. <laughs> I was on my way to a summer conference, a professional meeting. So I had a reason to drive my thousand miles, but yeah. Uh, the irony of it, right? And this is exactly what happens. Um, it's, and it also in the US, it's tied to nationalism, like, yay, America, we have this wonderful system of national parks. Aren't we great? We're the best. Um, all right, so Germany, okay. So Germany has a very different view they accept limits to growth. Um, they really understand that you have to shift your consumption habits and production. So I'm actually, my dad was all Swedish and the Swedes, 
especially the Scandinavian countries, they really, they get it more than other countries. And um, they, what they did was give tax breaks if you would buy higher quality appliances. So you don't buy a new appliance all the time. They just have a lot of programs like that, right? They make a lot of distinctions and they really focus on consumption, shifting consumption habits. Whereas Americans don't want to shift their habits. And at best, if it's cheaper to buy the green product, they'll buy it, but they're not gonna do anything unless it's cheaper. Cost benefit analysis. And yeah, it's just scary. So, okay, the green program in India. So the author brings up Chip, Chipco, which we already read about. Um, but this is where the peasants are being affected the most, right? They're the most affected by both corporations that run on fossil fuels and destruction, and they're being pushed off the land by the deep ecology movement, right? So they're suffering twice. Um, all right, so questions of equity distribution of wealth, who gets to use the environment for what? Uh, the state versus rural communities, this is urban versus rural, um, local versus national and international um, social justice issues. Um, okay. Yeah, so again, they keep, um, focusing on resources rather than controlling desires. Okay, all right. So, all right, so let me go back. So I did talk about how scientific, the scientific revolution, uh, John Locke focused on individualism, materialism, so you were gonna exploit nature so that our material well-being would be better, right? Something physical, better housing, better health care, better sewer systems, better, you know, something tangible. And so, yeah, science deals with what's tangible and you can prove that this or that creates more material wealth. Um, but what do you do? Um, how are you gonna, right? How are you gonna stop this? How are you gonna stop consumption habits when for 300 years, that was, that was a corrupt interpretation of our salvation was that science, we are the, pro, we uh, progress means more science, more technology, uh, better and better consumer goods, uh, higher quality of life meant um, consumption, got related to consumption. How are we going to stop that? Um, so one thing I'd like you to comment on, you comment on anything you want, but I think one of the big ironies, the, you know, Rotel's good, paved with good intentions, was that the poor get screwed no matter what, right? When So the elite, right? The deep ecologists belong to an elite. So I know that I'm part of the elite class, even if my income is not. For, for a number of years, I had below middle-class income. And um, I, have, I have lived in below middle class housing for decades. But that's, you know, compared to where you guys live, it's it's not it's fine. There's no problem with it. But um, uh, I still belong to the elite. I know I do, because it's just my education. 
um, starving artists. They're part of the elite. So the elite always benefit from either side, right? They benefit from environmental destruction, but it's all for the sake of human well being, really. And then the deep ecologists come along and say, you guys are all wrong. We have to do wilderness preservation. Again, the elite benefit and the poor get screwed once again. The elite all of a sudden now have these wonderful parks to go to and they have, you know, uh, wilderness preservation and they, you know, they can make money off of selling these trips. And I mean, it just, <laughs> you end up right back where you started and you also end up with environmental imperialism, right? Where the West comes in, buys out land, pushes the poor off, you know, creates a product, which is just uh, people visiting national parks or wilderness preservation areas. So how did that go wrong, right? Um, so that's kind of one of the main points I wanted to, to point out. But any of you can always pick out what struck you because you are writing your book about the environment. Um, and what I would like you to do uh, is find out if there's some example in your country. Do you know of a wilderness preservation area? Or do you know, do you know an example of any of this stuff going on in your country, in Bangladesh? Um, I, I don't know, right? But I, India, maybe some of you might not know of any in Sri Lanka or Bangladesh or something, but they might know about something in India. So it would be nice in your post to have some example of that, or if you wanna look it up, um, of course, I was like learning about that. That's why I want to send you off to do it because I really like learning about that. But anyway, so Sauda, do you have a reaction to the reading today? Do you have another reaction after I've spoken? Um, I mean, it seems all really obvious that it's uh, overconsumption and everything that we are doing right now is ultimately will end up being our like downfall and it, we will like we're getting over in our head right now and we're not trying to see the bigger picture but we need to start acting more responsibly and see the that like our we're we're in the end right now it seems like that this is uh we are the ones that profiting this is for our own good but in the end ultimately we will be we are actually harming ourselves so we need to be like more aware and responsible with our resources yeah, I, I do want to say that I am aware that I do have a higher fossil fuel carbon footprint than probably all my students at AUW. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm sorry about that. Uh, it's, you know, it's like you can't live without doing some of this stuff. Um, but I will say, compared to my siblings, oh my gosh. My brother, his carbon footprint is just huge. He flies all over the place. Um, but, you know, you can't do that. You can't just keep pointing your finger. You just have to kind of figure out what you can do and then do it. Um, but you don't have to worry that Professor Beck is going to make you feel guilty if you, I bought something to drink in a plastic container today because it was hot. <laughs> I didn't used to do that at all. Uh, but anyway, I confess. All right, Shamima, what have you got? 
professor before i read this like this article and i couldn't understand anything i was trying to find out everything by go, by researching the outside sources so after your explanation i understand some so professor i have one question according related this article it was like i don't understand what does it mean especially this is like in the article mentioned the radical shift in consumption and production partners require creation alternative economic and political structure professor i'm confused with that can you please explain me a bit briefly okay could you say it more slowly it's really hard to hear professor can you hear me okay yeah just try saying it again there is like one sentence it, like i couldn't understand i was really confused with that can you please explain me briefly a bit like this mention radical shift in consumption and production partner required creation alternative economic and political structure so I was trying to find out this one, but I can even like relate throughout my country and other outside sources. I right. don't understand. Economic and political what? Economic and political structures. What was that last word? The last word is like creation of alternative alternate economic and political okay. structure yeah okay so the structure we have the economic structure we have right now is that you use fossil fuels and natural resources to create whatever consumer products and you want to and you try to get people to believe that they need it right you try to create desires for unnecessary stuff in order to make money. Does that make sense? Yes, Professor. And also, it's like related also with political expression. Right. So, corporations that make a lot of money pay politicians. Um, so, you know, what I think is funny is that in developing countries, sometimes they literally bribe them, right? So the politician in Indonesia, somebody wants to come in and, and uh, mine for minerals, right? And so the politician says, well, you can come in, but you gotta hand over some dough under the table, right? I'll let you in. You got you got a few hundred thousand bucks, you know, and so that's considered bribery. Um, but sometimes, you know, the, sometimes the corporations don't want to be corrupted like that, but they want to come in there. So the politician sort of insists on it. Why not? Like, why wouldn't the politician sort of force the corporation to pay him a little bit of money? And that's considered corrupt. Now, in my country, my country doesn't rank high on the corruption scale because we do it. Well, first of all, we have a whole lot of laws that shouldn't exist. And, you know, our corporation should be breaking the laws because the laws should be decent laws, but they're not. But the, polit the corporations say, you know, they don't bribe the politician. They don't give the politician money in their pocket. They just pay for their political campaign, right? So, oh, who's the head of your political campaign, you know? Oh, uh, yeah, I guess I'll get in touch with them, you know? And incidentally, there's a law coming up that would harm my company. So uh, I'll find out, you know, how you vote on that. And then I'll make my decision about my campaign contribution this year. And American people, when they decide how to vote, 
a month before the election, they turn on the TV and look at the ads, which is ridiculous. Like you shouldn't buy anything by looking at the ads. But that's how the political system gets corrupted by fossil fuel guzzling billionaires. Does that make sense, Shamima? Yes, Professor. And also, like they mentioned, according to the authors, as his understanding that all environmental processes are totally different with deep ecology. So, how is totally different with deep ecology? Oh, okay. Deep ecology would be um, that. Let me see. Okay. So they would want to change the, the economic system completely so that we do not exploit nature, right? For consumer goods anymore. Okay. I mean, it's radical, right? It would require this huge, huge shift which is not gonna happen, but they could, they do feel good about themselves, right? <laughs> that they have such nice ideas, even though they're completely unworkable. Um, so, well, let's see. So what the deep ecologists want, well, some of them, I think it's, you know, it said, we're gonna have to have like, 2 billion people, we're gonna to have to go down to 2 billion people or something. So there are disagreements. This is related, but nothing you read. There's a big issue about carrying capacity of the earth. How many people can the earth sustain and still have a, without destroying the ecosystem, right? And that's called the carrying capacity. So Shamima, what I'm getting at is how radical is this in terms of changing our political and economic system, right? It would also have to have things like forced sterilization so that we lower the population numbers. Um, and some deep ecologists were talking like that, okay? Um, let's see. And there just is a lot of disagreement about how much the earth, how many people, it depends upon how high a lifestyle they want and what sort of lifestyle they have. So, okay, Shamima, does that, is that good enough for, Answering your question that it would just require this radical, radical shift? No, miss. Uh, actually, I didn't read whole article for that. I'm a little bit confused now. I understand a bit. Thank you. Okay. Because I will write it again. Okay. Um, yeah, it is. You can, you can give me feedback at the end of the semester about which articles really were too hard to read. Um, you know, sometimes, so, you know, I just get used to this, obviously. I'm a native English speaker and I read philosophy books, but I really don't like it. If scholars want a broad number of people to read their work, why don't they write it in a way that a broad number of people would have that vocabulary. So I apologize. Um, at least I think the stuff that you read that I wrote isn't so bad. Usually, you know, I try to write in a way that's more accessible, but no problem asking questions. And please don't obsess that you don't understand everything. If you could just spend an hour reading it and come to class prepared and ask questions, that's great. Because then you'll follow it. You'll know exactly where you didn't get it. And I, and I can explain it and then you can, it'll come together for you. So I'm glad that you came prepared. That's the main thing. Um, Rossi, so do you have some other comments? Not really, but I just want to emphasize what you said about not pointing fingers. I think 
we all know that um, developed countries should take the responsibility in terms of reducing overconsumption and militarization, but we should all take part and be like Greta Thunberg in a way where we use our daily actions in um, producing change and voice it and expand it and make it louder so other people see what is going on and can in a way be inspired by our actions to take that small step in making the necessary changes. Okay. Do you all know about the 360 degree, the Fridays for the Future? I, I get their stuff, you know, probably every day or two. I can always forward it, but I don't want to do that unless students want it because there's way too many emails that come in. So if you ever want it, just let me know. Um, Shazneen, have you got some other comment before I close up? Um, not really, Professor. Okay. Like everything I want to say has already been said. I don't want to repeat. Was there any one thing that surprised you when you read this? Um, not particularly. It's just like, oh, I hadn't thought of that, but oh yeah, that that's what would happen. The poor yeah. would get screwed again. Yes, Professor. <laughs> okay, Mosa. No, Professor, it's not surprising me because the situation is happening. It's really related to the readings, and like we are, you know, habituated with that this kind of circumstances. For example, as you mentioned, poor are getting poor, and then rich people are getting rich, and then all are focusing on consuming and this kind of thing. So it's uh, there is nothing to surprise me. Okay. Oh, there's Sristi. Are you? So can you hear us, Sristi? Okay. Um, so, um, so from now on, I, th I think my goal is something like this, to assign about eight pages, like I did for today, and that you would go to, a, to the web and find some example in your country related to the reading, right? Like some wilderness preservation area or some, ex you know, national park and what were poor people pushed off who funded you know who funded the money to push them off is it international organizations do you think it's a good thing right it's it's not cut and dried it's not always bad it's not always good were the farmers there actually damaging the environment to the point where it needed to be preserved or were they actually having did they have sustainable uh, practices or could they have been convinced to farm in a more sustainable way so you don't push them off the land um, so <laughs> there's only five students left but i guess for those of you who are going to watch to youtube um, is it is it clear sort of from now on what I hope we can do? We're going to be talking about more recent history, but then the boots on the ground, the stuff that was debated and started to be implemented into policy decades ago now is still having impact or there's been a reaction against that. So now we're getting we're getting closer to the boots on the ground and then you all tell the rest of us what's actually going on in your countries or in your village or in, you know, can be very immediate. It can, or it can be regional, it can be national, it can be Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is one of the hardest hit places for climate change. So. Yeah, all of you, I'm sure, know that you have a lot at stake. None of you are calling it a hoax. <laughs> um, 
And okay, so we can we can break earlier if there's any other question. Um, yeah, so Saristi's having network problems. Does anyone have any more questions? Because we don't have to go for three hours. We can go for two hours. It's fine with me. All right. Um, no, Professor. Okay. I just want to tell the students that couldn't come and are looking at the YouTube that I'm sorry, you know, so many of you behind. I will do what I can. I think I've kind of gotten it reduced to the what I consider the bare bones to make it a respectable class. And, you know, I'll work with you however I can. So I did forget office hours yesterday, but I will, there will be office hours tomorrow at this time. Okay, so take care. Thank you, Dr. Beck. You too, Professor, Bye. thank you so much. Thank you, I just appreciate all of you so much. Um, um, will you hold like an office hour? Like now? Yes, sure. I think I'll stop the recording. Um, well, maybe I'll pause it because honestly, Rossi, you might say things that the YouTube watchers might want to hear. So here we go. That due on July 1st? Yes. That's oh, boy. <laughs> okay, guys. I can push that back because... I haven't gotten very many of the first papers yet. So I can push that back to the 10th. It's just the more I push it back, the more students have all this stuff collecting. But, you know, I just, they have to organize. They have to figure out how do I get this done, this done, this done. So, so sure, everybody, I can push that to July 10th. That's fine. Um, so Rossi, what you got? What are, what are you thinking of writing on? Um, I was thinking of writing about um, the depletion in the biodiversity in the Tunle Sap Lake in Cambodia. Um, so I grew up by the Tunle Sap Lake and it's one of the biggest freshwater here. However, in recent years, a lot of the fish and a lot of the marine life there here was lost due to overfishing and people using overfishing and then pollutants being poured into there. And so I wanna look into like the different reasons that caused the decrease in the biodiversity and potentially um, the possible solutions that I can offer to help restore i guess right. the marine life there do you know if any of it is either pesticides herbicides I runoff think, runoff from those uh, a portion of that comes from there because um there are farmlands surrounding like the the lake is surrounded by five provinces and these five provinces are known for farming. So potentially the chemicals through the waterways will go into the lake and causing the death of the fish. But I don't think that that is um, as important as overfishing and using illegal fishing and like officials not taking the necessary means to implement the laws. Like there are laws talking about illegal fishing and overfishing and fishing during like um, breeding system, uh, season, but still they don't fully implement it. So um, my aim for this paper is looking into ways that the locals, the people who live on the lake can do to actually preserve the fish population because their lives are dependent on fishing so if like big companies or those who use illegal um, fishing tools come in and take away all the fish 
then they don't have a mean of survival. So, yeah. Um, so I will say to the people listening on YouTube that the idea behind the class was that we had those original ideas and then a paper about your environmental ethic. And then we had, now we're moving toward boots on the ground, like what's actually happening, how are people's religions being used or abused, um, and then the history behind some of this stuff, and students bring in examples, and the second paper, right, is about pursuing that further, just like Rossi, Rossi's example. So that's the way the course is structured to actually work like that. And then your last paper is just your environmental ethic, like how you put it all together. But yeah, Rossi is, you know, gonna find out something close to home and then write her second paper about that, just do more research. So from now to the rest of the class, you do have to find some example close to home of whatever we're reading about. So there would be naturally something that you would want to pursue further. So, and the research paper isn't supposed to be that long. It's three other sources. I think it's 1200 words. Yes, 1200 words. So, so that's the idea behind the way the class was structured. Um, all right. It sounds good, Rossi. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bank. Sure. Goodbye. Goodbye.